Hierbij I open this academic ceremony in which Elina Mietenis will defend the academic thesis Access to Adequate Maternal Care in Eastern Europe. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Good luck. Dear family, friends and colleagues that are present today in Aula and the many of you that are following online, in the coming 15 minutes, I will introduce you to my dissertation entitled Access to Adequate Maternal Care in Eastern Europe. So why this dissertation? In Eastern Europe, women die noticeably more often from preventable causes related to childbirth and pregnancy compared to Western Europe. Despite the East-West comparison, if you uh, zoom into Eastern Europe, also large disparities exist. When you look at the picture on the right side, you can see the Eastern, some Eastern European countries that were included in the, in the dissertation and the maternal deaths per 100,000 live births that exist there when compared to some of the Western European countries. Vital factor for positive health outcomes for all women is the access to adequate maternal care. Maternal care is care women receive during pregnancy, birth, and 42 days after that by their maternal care provider which usually is a gynecologist of mid or midwife. So the aim of this dissertation was to find out what are the main barriers to access adequate maternal care in Eastern Europe. This dissertation employed framework, which served as a base for this dissertation and looked at access to adequate maternal care from five aspects, availability, appropriateness, affordability, approachability, and acceptability. System level indicators, such as the number of healthcare, uh, healthcare um, uh, in institutions and providers and public healthcare coverage is only partly uh, indicating the access to adequate maternal care. It doesn't capture such aspects as uh, distribution of healthcare facilities, the provider attitude or ability to pay for care. I want to elaborate on this, um, on this framework because I will be using these concepts throughout my presentation today. Availability refers to the geographical distance and the distribution of healthcare facilities, the, the maternal care providers, and also the services available to women. It also refers to the opening hours and the waiting lists. Appropriateness refers to how care is provided in terms of provider skills and knowledge, medical equipment such as uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, um, uh, conditions of facilities. It also refers, uh, affordability refers to the ability to pay for care and also refers to the formal and informal patient payments. Approachability refers to the provider attitude and the communication and acceptability refers to um, the perceived need of women to seek care, which is related to health literacy, cultural aspects and other norms and values. So to answer the main question, this dissertation reviewed the published ev uh, evidence in the literature in Eastern European countries. The study too uh, looked at evidence from five, uh, five aspects to access uh, of matern adequate, adequate maternal care in Georgia by using qualitative analysis of interviews with healthcare providers and decision makers and focus group discussions with mothers who recently gave birth in Georgia. The study three um, investigated five aspects of access to adequate maternal care in Latvia by using mixed methods and analysis with, uh, with, uh, in, of interviews with healthcare providers and decision makers and online surveys um, from the perspectives of mothers who recently gave birth, birth in Latvia. The study four compared the five aspects of access to adequate maternal care in Romania, Bulgaria and, and Moldova uh, by statistically analyzing the online survey data of mothers who recently gave birth in these three countries. Finally, the study five compared 
the affordability and appropriateness of inpatient maternal care in Ukraine by comparing mater in, inpatient maternal care users to, maternal ca to inpatient users who didn't use maternal care. Statistical analysis uh, using matching methods were used and household uh, survey data was employed. The systematic review revealed large gaps in evidence that exist in this region, which implies that better quality and more representative data should be collected. It also revealed um, barriers in all five aspect, uh, aspects of access uh, to maternal care. With respect to availability, it was limited to outdated equipment and training curricula uh, providers, um, also shortage of maternal care providers and medical supplies such as pharmaceuticals. Furthermore, it was also limited to geographical distance to healthcare facilities and also the large waiting times. In, uh, there was inappropriate communication of providers found in relation to appropriateness of care. But also some women were unaware of the importance of the use of maternal care, which was embedded into cultural aspects. Finally, the most important barrier was found the inability to pay for care in Eastern Europe. The study too in Georgia revealed um, barriers in care provision with respect to lack of resources in terms of um, provide, uh, healthcare provider availability and also medical devices and the almost non-existent postnatal care. The first quotation is an example that, for that. I had problems with breastfeeding and it was a problem that there was no postnatal care which strikes the most mothers. Furthermore, the maternal care standards were also inappropriate um, in terms of uh, provider, provider knowledge and skills, evidence-based treatment, and uh, also provider attitudes, and the perceived need of women to carefully pick maternal care providers to avoid such poor attitudes. And the second, um, second quotation is an example for that. In Georgia, maternal mortality is high due to low quality of antenatal care. Problems are not identified in time because of underqualified staff. Also, there are inequalities across population groups, especially the high mountain rural population groups and the minority population groups. This was found due to uh, geographical access to, to healthcare facilities and the weak transportation infrastructure because the care is mostly located in the capital region. But this was also related to inability to pay for services and the related um, travel costs. Um, and then uh, maternal care financing, with respect to maternal care financing, the public, uh, the, the uh, governmental uh, coverage has increased in, in, uh, in the past years. However, there are still gaps of coverage in the coverage and the poor population groups are not protected from the high out-of-pocket payments uh, in uh, for maternal care. And the third quotation is an example for that. I, need an extra, I needed an extra test due to my high risk pregnancy that was expensive. I had to pay out of pocket and I needed support for my family. Otherwise it was not possible. The study three in Latvia, it revealed problems in care provision that includes um, poor provider attitudes. Assuring care, um, access to adequate maternal care can be problematic also for well-off and well-informed women, but even more so for less informed women and women who cannot afford the care in private sector and are limited to publicly funded services. The study also revealed insufficient use of medical guidelines. With respect to availability, it was limited um, uh, due to geographical distance to facilities and especially was problematic so for women that are living in rural areas. There's also increasing shortage of medical providers, um, especially in rural areas. And with respect to affordability, we found that um, it was not problematic in Latvia as when compared to other countries in this region. However, there are still inequi uh, large inequities in terms of affording the care in private sector. And you can see that 42% of women received at least partly care in private sector. The antenatal care seeking behavior in Latvia is quite high. You can see that 74% of women received at least eight antenatal care visits, which is the recommended number. 
However, it is recommended to receive at least four postnatal visits. And here you can see that 12% women only receive three or more postnatal care visits. To a lesser extent, um, health and um, lifestyle related issues and health literacy were found to be barriers related to uh, acceptability of care. And these factors can limit um, the care seeking behavior. The study in Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova revealed extremely high rates of cesarean sections, especially in Bulgaria with 53% and Romania with 61%. Um, there was also insufficient number of antenatal care visits received, especially in Moldova, 38%, and postnatal care visits, especially in Bulgaria, with 17% of women receiving three or more visits. Women in all these three countries who received care, uh, who, who were having health complications during, uh, during maternal period, who gave birth through C-section, who birthed in public facility and who had fewer antenatal care visits um, were more likely to experience access barriers to adequate maternal care. And these barriers were, rela were related to four domains, availability, appropriateness, approachability, and affordability. Finally, the fifth study, which compared the inpatient maternal care users in Ukraine to inpatient care users that didn't use maternal care, revealed that with respect to affordability, maternal care users paid informally more often, higher amounts, and were requested to do so more often. With respect to appropriateness, the care, stance, care satisfaction was found to be low in both groups, maternal care users and non-maternal care users. However, the maternal care users were more, satisf more satisfied overall with the care, but also more specifically with treatment efficiency, with sanitary conditions, with access to diagnostic tests and provider qualifications. In conclusion, the five access related indicators are important for a comprehensive evaluation of the provision of maternal care. It is also important for the countries where barriers to access adequate maternal care are concealed by the relatively good uh, macro level indicators. Access to adequate maternal care is a multifaceted problem and the action is required beyond policy level to ensure the access to good uh, adequate maternal care for all women. More efficient allocation of the existing resources and building on good practices are the starting points for reducing these access barriers. Thank you. Dear candidate, thank you for this uh, presentation. I give the word to the first uh, opposition, in which will be opened by Professor Brandt. He is uh, chair of this assessment committee and professor of European Public Health at this university. Dear Poractor, thank you for handing over. Dear candidate, thank you very much for this overview of your PhD uh, thesis uh, that we read with pleasure and uh, went through the different chapters to see how your research was done over the last years. If I remember right, you are a bachelor in European public health, where uh, a lot of these European issues already uh, were discussed. And uh, three of those countries, Bulgaria, Latvia and Romania, are now members of the European Union and already for some time. My first question would be, do those countries that are members of the European Union differ from the results, outcomes, prevalences, incidences to Georgia, Moldova and the Ukraine that are not members? So is there, are there two groups or not and do they differ? And the second one is um, normally in such a setting one would ask, well, what can the European Union do? And um, the term European Union only comes, appears three times in your thesis. One time in the text and two references use this term. That made me wonder, um, are there no possibilities of the European Union to bring about change? What would be your ideas, what the EU can do to help at least those three countries that are there and uh, of course in the neighborhood policy 
to help the other three too. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for compliments of my thesis and thank you for your two questions. Um, thinking of how to how to uh, go about those questions, the first one was about whether there is a clear division between European Union countries and those countries that are outside European Union. And I think to me it depends what are we comparing? Is this are these mortality rates that we are comparing, or these are other indicators that we are comparing uh, between the European and non-European countries? Um, I have to say that maybe also a reason why there was not a clear EU and non-EU division in the thesis because some of those issues are really uh, interrelated, but they are going across uh, across across the borders, but also so they are present in both EU and non-EU countries. Um, you can see also maybe I can open uh, one of the slides uh, where the incidence rates were there um, that. You can see in maternal mortality rates, uh, and and for example in Latvia with 19 uh, per hundred thousand, and also uh, in Moldova, uh, Romania, but also in countries uh, outside EU. So with respect to those indicators, I can say there is not a real clear division. You would expect that EU indicators would be better than uh, in in countries outside outside the uh, European Union. Oh, in study three, you say Latvia affordability not a problem. So that's why I was saying it depends which indicators are we looking at. If you're looking at mortality rates, this is not clear. But when we are zooming into, there are clear differences. And for example, indicators such as affordability was really in Latvia not found to be a problem. But it was found to be a problem in Romania, which is also an EU country now. Um, I think the underlying issues are different. And uh, and one of the reasons why in Latvia it might be a less uh, problem to a lesser extent is, first of all, how the care is arranged in the country, how maternal care is arranged, what is the coverage. And other is economic, uh, econo general economic situation. Um, I believe that in Latvia, when you compare to to Romania, the general economic situation is better, and this might be an indicator why women didn't perceive um, such a financial burden. And also the fact that in general, for maternal care, this is not an unexpected event, and you can prepare for it. So then you are also maybe more um, prepared to, to, to spend this money. Uh, that's uh, my view on first question. And the second, what could EU actually do to help uh, to help the countries? And I want to now relate to uh, my one of the propositions in thesis, which is number eight. Uh, no, about EU number nine. I will read it out. There should be more equality in access, affordability, and quality of care within the EU. And we know that. Um, health system is the responsibility of a single country. And this is why also there are differences found in yes, care but, systems but and that also... Is just, you ask for it, so what should Europe do to achieve this field? Yes, I, in, I, in my view also, as I'm writing here, that there should be ensured more access and we should have more affordability and better quality. The question is what, what Europe can do in this respect, which is not overriding the rights of of um, of uh, these single member states. And I think that um, one thing would be uh, perhaps looking at quality. If there are some quality standards that could be, uh, that, that should be employed in each, uh, each European country, and that could be maybe a factor that could already help. Maybe there are some, there could be some quality indicators for maternal care that should be followed by all, um, all countries in the European Union that could at least improve the appropriateness of care. And uh, also the use of medical guidelines. Uh, if you think of that, then uh, in, we saw that in some countries, the medical guidelines had more um, a suggestive, um, um, how do you say that, a suggestive um, power, and other in other countries, they, they had to be followed. And that's, and these are also countries within the European Union, which indicates that there are differences. 
uh, with, among the different countries, but also within a country. And the difficult part is that, uh, yeah, health system and arrangements of health system is, is a responsibility of a, of a single country. And of course, we cannot, we cannot um, apply the rules and regulations and then the whole system in one country to completely plug it in into another country because there are so many other factors as cultural aspects, historical aspects, the economical capabilities, and and also where how the health system is looking right now. But uh, I hope that there's may I just before you make up the whole no of course there are possibilities of the European Union. For example the European semester there are country specific recommendations that can cover health too. And at the moment, at the European Parliament, there is a discussion between the Polish uh, ministers and Ms. van der Leyen about the 60 billion, I think, is it, structural funds that are not given to Poland, perhaps. So this could be something, for example, too. And this is linked to certain uh, criteria that can be used in the healthcare system, too. But thank you for your, for your outline. I can pick. I hope this at least partly answered your question. Yeah, no, it's fine. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by our external member of the assessment committee, Dr. Erika Richardson. She is honorary associate professor of the London School of Hygiene and Topical Medicine. And for the candidate, maybe you can keep a little bit more distance between the microphone and yourself. Thank you very much. Um, dear candidate, um, I was particularly interested in your thesis in the more qualitative work that you did in Georgia and Latvia. And I felt they provided very interesting insights into the complexity of informality within health systems, whereas the traditional focus has always been on informal pay payments. So my question to you is, uh, whether you feel countries could eradicate informality in health systems without tax reform, what other approaches could they do, given that the wider informality within a health system is linked to things like personal contacts to get better quality care, or what is perceived to be better quality care? So how can we tackle informality in our health systems? Or is it just a matter for the tax system? Thank you. Esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliments and thank you for, for the question. Um, informality indeed is a very, very big problem, as, as you can see that in many chapters of my dissertation. And um, if you're thinking of how to go about it, um, I think it is such a complex issue and that's why there is not one single solution that will work or that could work. Um, and, and if it was so simple, then these problems were solved. But um, so what have some countries done in order to go about at least informal payments were formal to allow um, for formal fees. So to, um, for example, in Georgia, what they did and also partly in Latvia, um, the private sector is quite well developed and therefore those fees that used to be informal before are formalized. But um, that doesn't solve the whole issue of informality, as you were mentioning. Um, there's, there's still, even though you are paying uh, for care officially and out of pocket, women still don't, don't feel, um, women still feel the need to ensure that they are safe, that they will have adequate care, that they will be treated with respect, and they do so also with um, um, establishing connections and then and see uh, like ensuring that exactly this provider is going to treat me. And then I know that in my fragile state during birth, I'm not going to be mistreated. But how to go about this? I think this is a wider societal issue. And also these, um, these informalities um, are there in place, but um, how to reverse them. So I think from working from two perspectives, from the provider's perspective, look tack, um, like targeting those, but also the society. Also, women need to understand um, that 
uh, these informalities, um, for example, bringing br uh, well informal payments, not in, in not in form of cash, but also in uh, in form of of, uh, of goods, that this is not acceptable that this is not normalized anymore in culture and i think that ne that also needs to be changed because if we simply would uh, see from system perspective and we would not accept any more any fees um then women still maybe would feel the need that they are still not safe and they still want to ensure and they still want to look for for a provider uh, where they would feel in safe hands and also to not normalize it uh, in to, or to not allow it from the care provider in the healthcare setting. So better governance in that sense, not only having this, uh, uh, making the payments from uh, informal to formal, but also generally uh, having having better governance and, and um, that these payments are, are not allowed anymore, but that there are also consequences for, for allowing such payments. And okay, also, so, um, sorry, if I could just jump in, um, surely a formal payment is still a barrier to access. It's just something that can be taxed. It's not an informal payment is no less or, or greater barrier to access than a formal payment, surely. And secondly, are, is the informality in the system something that is it the problem? Or is it the solution to a different problem? So are we using yeah, informality to get the quality of care that we want? Or is it a problem in and of itself? Yeah, I think we have to look here at the reason why these informalities are in place. Um, and um, if if these informalities are in place because women need to ensure better quality, then maybe we need to do something about the quality of care. And then women, women would trust the health healthcare system and trust that they're in safe hands. And there would be no need to use such informalities such as, uh, you know, by these informalities, I mean that uh, you are, that you are, um, uh, knowing some healthcare provider, or you know that who is going to treat you, and then and by that you know that you're in safe hands. If you could trust, if a woman could trust that whoever has a shift at that time, she's giving birth, she's going to be in safe hands, and and uh, no complications uh, will be unnoticed. Then there wouldn't be a need for such informal in, informalities. Also, if there were no wait long late waiting lists, you didn't need to take a phone and give a call. I know you, do you have a free spot? Can I come because I feel something is maybe wrong? And then, yeah, that person is accessing care faster, coming to, to, uh, to see the provider, but other people who don't have such relationship with the provider would not receiving, uh, would maybe then have as a consequence a longer waiting list. So this is creating these uh, inequalities in access to. Um, and even if, so when the when the situation is improved in terms of quality, then I think also pro, uh, women need to uh, be informed that that there are some quality improvements and they can be they can be reassured that it is it is okay to trust. And you know this is this is a different field. Maternal care is very, is is very woman is very fragile during birth, and I can only imagine how it feels. Um, when you were there um, and you you haven't ensured that you don't have that trust in the system and uh, and you don't know who is going to treat you and you have to besides what is going on in your body in your mind that you need to worry how someone is going to treat you whether you will be treated with respect and dignity and uh, I can say from my experience 25 hours in horrible horrible pain but you know what made what 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 made my experience actually good that i can look at it and say yes i struggled in insanely but i made it there was a moment when i thought i'm not i'm not going to make it and then at that point i really knew i'm in safe hands you know i am i am there there's people next to me and there was a whole team next to me starting from my husband midwife, care providers, everyone who just cheered for me. And I 
and I can only imagine how it feels when you have to think, oh, can I now say so? Can I, can I, am I allowed to scream and show the pain? Because maybe they will yell at me. So, and you know, because there is this trust to care system, you don't, you don't need any informalities. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mind which midwife will assist me in birth. And I think this is something that would be really great for women in Eastern Europe to just know that they can trust when they are the most vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by uh, Professor Gunta Lasdane. She is uh, also online and she is Professor of Reproductive Health of Riga Stradens University. The word is yours. Dear Commissioner, dear Elena, uh, happy name day. And uh, Latvians are celebrating name day. I can't, uh, of course, I'm to confirm that we are from the same original country, Latvia. And uh, I really would like to compliment you with the depth and original research you have carried out in, in so many countries and very diverse with uh, a lot of methodologies and, and interesting results. So thank you for that. But of course, uh, as opposition, I have quite a number of questions. So I'll start with some, and of course we'll see whether there will be some more time for others. So um, you emphasize uh, a lot the importance of the knowledge and skills of maternal health providers. And I fully agree that that's very, very important. Um, however, uh, I'm also a teaching staff in the university now. And you uh, have mentioned that uh, what should, that the curriculum, medical curriculum in the Central and Eastern Europe is, is, should be overhauled. So um, that means all we are doing so far is not the optimal. How you really see, how would you give us uh, those teaching in Eastern uh, Europe and those countries you have mentioned, what would be your recommendation for how to proceed with your suggestions and recommendations? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for compliments. Thank you for congratulating me on my name day. And uh, um, when thinking of the medical curriculum that was found to be outdated in many Eastern European countries and thinking how to go about it, then one thing that comes to my mind um, when looking from the perspective of my dissertation is the competency of communication. I think that competency, if that is a part of the curriculum when pro the upcoming providers in future are trained on how to communicate with, in this case, women, but more generally with their patients, that the, also that the patient is more put in the center of care. So the patient-centered care, that direction, I think that would be very important component because the knowledge and the skills of, of uh, care providers, we were, um, I was asking this to women and, and care providers. So this is only from the perspectives of women. So these are perceived. Um, so this is the perceived appropriateness of care. So of course, I was not measuring the, the, the clinical quality. So oftentimes the cl clinical quality is good, um, but it for women, if they're experienced, if they don't feel safe in other uh, in providers' hands, and if they are mistreated, so there's it's more than only physical uh, physical layer of taking care of uh, pregnancies and birth. It's also psychological, and the communication is very important because it also shows that it can be a barrier to even seek the care. So if they are mistreated, if if nothing is explained to them or little is explained to them, maybe. Um, they experience some other barriers and they accumulate and in the end they are skipping the visits. They're not going to seek the provider. So we really, and seeing how, how vital, how important it is to seek maternal care to avoid these very avoidable um, causes of morbidity and mortality, then I think that 
communication com competency would be something to start with. I'm happy you are really um, prioritizing competency, uh, communication skill, because uh, this is something that we have introduced during the last few years in our university. So at least in Latvia, it will be done. But thank you for that. So I go for my second question because I have time for that. So you emphasize that there is a lack of reliable, easy, accessible information regarding pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period in one of the main challenges uh, in many Central and Eastern European countries. You have confirmed this statement. So this problem is closely related to low health literacy, as you have mentioned, of many women, and existing myths and misconceptions. As you have studied through a thoroughly, not only published literature sources, but had interviews with women, what would you suggest as a next step in provision of such reliable, easy, accessible information? And I would say in COVID time, it's even more important than before. So could you please give your suggestions because we are to again follow them. Thank you for your question. Um, before giving a direct answer, I think it is important to keep in mind some cultural aspects too. Um, and also the way the way uh, people usually seek, seek answers to their questions. Um, it also, so this, uh, how, how much people rely on their networks how much people they rely on informal sources of information. Um, I had the impression that there it is much more established or it's much more likely that people are um, re uh, receiving answers through the in, uh, informal networks. And um, so, so maybe that's, that's also, that also on one hand complicates the problem, but on the other hand, it is also good if, if women are trying to seek seek advice um, in their in their networks of friends and family who had experiences. But you also mentioned that uh, there are different myths and so the information received might not be of high quality um, and how to go about it. Well it's it's a very I think it's a very tough one and a, a difficult one because it um, it involves uh, it, in, it, all, it involves society, so how to communicate that. Um, I know that, for example, in Latvia, there is one trustworthy source, Grudnetsiv.lv, where women can uh, can see, uh, so it's pregnancy.lv, where women can uh, can follow their pregnancy week by week and and uh, and see what is. Uh, there are different recommendations based based on evidence that are suggested, but. Um, um, apart from that, another another um, information uh, point is their um, maternal care providers, and I think that's also a very trustworthy source. But the the, the little challenge is that their uh, the the visit, the time of the visit, it's not it's not unlimited. So there are these thirty, twenty, fifteen minutes. It depends uh, depends which provider, depends which facility. But there's just so many questions you can ask and so many answers you can get. But perhaps if there is what now comes to my mind, if if there is good communication between the provider and the woman, then woman also can open up and ask really these questions to the provider instead of uh, silencing them inside her and then asking them to their mothers, grandmothers and, and friends around. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's very, I think it's very difficult to overcome it, how to make women follow more trustworthy sources. Internet is full with everything. Um, the social media, so many networks you can follow. And, and it's difficult to filter the information. Elena, so I, think I maybe promise this... difficult question. I promise difficult question. So you see, it is difficult. And yes, you have raised a very important problem but honestly, it's not that easy. In general, you have recommendations. However, it's not that easy to follow them because when you go to practical actions, it's a lot of questions again. So I hope that you will go on with research and help us to implement them. Recommendations you have 
uh, as a conclusion that I have really um, made in, of your research work. So thank you. Thank you, Elena. Let's go. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Jan Nijhuis. He is Emeritus Professor of Obstetrics and also the Secretary of this Assessment Committee. Thank you, Mr. Director. Dear candidate, first of all, congratulations uh, with your thesis, beautifully written, also for your team, of course. Um, but I'm a bit surprised. Um, it's a nice thesis, but when I read it, it's thought, oh, these countries, it's not, they're not doing well. And that's also what you're telling us. The last half hour or so, you have discussed it's all in communication, which obviously is not true, not all of it. And you're not doing so bad as you are writing in your thesis. I mean, if you look at the cesarean section rate, also in Italy, in the southern part of Italy, it's 61%. In the northern part of Italy, it's 24%. So, yes, we have differences. Also in France and Spain and Portugal and the Netherlands, we have rural areas where uh, everything is not available. Also in the Netherlands, we have a restricted uh, possibility to get epidural in 30% of the hospitals, 24-7. Um, we have also post-traumatic stress syndromes, which you will also have in Latvia, also in the Netherlands. Um, yes, we have social economic problems. If you walk through Rotterdam from left to right, perinatal mortality increases. Just by, in a few kilometers, the outcome is different. So a lot of things are true in Latvia or in Moldavia, but also in the Netherlands uh, or in France or Italy. And uh, I was surprised that you don't compare your data with the Euro Peristat data. Uh, that is strange because we have written nice reports uh, under the leadership of Jennifer Seidlin in Paris and your country is part of the European Union. And then I see the figures and I see that you have, for example, 24% uh, cesarean section rate. I'm not talking about repeat cesarean section rate. The median for Europe is 25. I mean, the WHO thinks that it should be lower, you can discuss that, but you're not doing that bad. Moldova is a poor country that has only 20% cesarean section rate. So it's it's not about being poor per se. So I would like to compliment you, first of all, that your country is not doing that bad. And and you could you could get more possibilities to improve if you say, are we not doing so bad, European Union, but we can do better. And you could say to your own people, we can do better. And I have the feeling that you start with saying we are not we're not doing it at all. That's not a Dutch philosophy. The Dutch always say we are great, which they aren't. They, they, they say we are the best in football and they lose and lose and never be a champion. So is that a mindset? Highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your, for your compliments on my thesis. That is interesting. And also for the many questions or many points that I can comment on or that I can uh, uh, yeah, give my answers to. Um, the final question is whether that's a mentality to say that we are bad. Um, maybe I need to seek out to my other opponent <laughs> uh, asking whether that's really a mentality. I don't think this is a mentality to say that we are so bad. Um, the aim of this dissertation was to find out what are the barriers that exist. Because many times the only we see uh, such macro level indicators such as C-section rates, um, maternal mortality, um, economic indicators, the public care coverage. And this is something that's very easy to compare. But I'm, my aim was more looking at the service uh, service indicators and look at the m not so much at the macro level and and uh, reveal the problems that are sometimes or oftentimes concealed. Um, and yes, 
I think I, I know that there is also mentioned. It is also mentioned in my thesis that in the systematic review that situation has improved in the past years. It has improved and it keeps improving, but we still cannot ignore the problems that exist there. And by identifying them, and the aim was to show people and the knowledge that these problems are there, not to close eyes. Yeah, they are here, but they're everywhere. Yes, they are everywhere, and they also shouldn't be ignored here. Also in the Netherlands, uh, problems should be identified, and something has to be do, uh, has to be done about it. And when uh, when we are referring to C-section rates, Latvia and Moldova are really doing good. Yeah. Yes. So, so you can be proud. <laughs> and of also it. the Netherlands, but when we talk about Bulgaria and yeah, when we talk high. about R Romania, more than 50% is not acceptable. And I was asking how many of the women had health complications, about 30%. So how do you explain that if they experience, only 30% of women experience complications during maternal period, maybe that's even after birth part of that. So why there are so many cesarean sections? Are there elective cesarean sections as well? And what are the factors that contribute to that? So it, it is deeper than that. Um, also, this, uh, and, and I don't say that these problems don't exist in some of the Western or Southern European countries like your real Italy. Um, but still, the aim of my dissertation was focusing only on the Eastern European countries. And therefore, I, I, uh, I was focusing on getting to know and capture the whole situation with respect to access to care from these five perspectives there. And, and, and yeah, I understand that if I may, may interrupt that, yeah. but, but still in your peers that you can compare some data and I didn't see any reference to your peers. That. That's, that's by itself. Well, okay. Unfortunately, I cannot do this anymore because it's already printed and it's <laughs> lying on your tables. But <laughs> yeah, but it's there, and even in your peer study, you can see that uh, that, for example, in uh, the first year mortality, you are doing better than the Netherlands. That I know. You're doing yeah. better, and you're improving. If you if you look at the two reports, then you see how your countries are really improving much faster than we are. So it's a compliment for your country. And Thank keep you. up the good yeah. things, I would say. Uh, I would like to go to, to another uh, question, which surprised me. No, what intrigued me, and that's your proposition six. One of your power names can probably read out the proposition. Okay. Yeah. Um, number six. If you want to know how strong a country's health system is, look at the well-being of its mothers. Yeah, that's said by Hillary Clinton who has just written a, a, a page turner, uh, I've heard, quite a detective, but this is another story of Hillary Clinton. What I'm curious about is where and when did she say it and in what sort of context, where did she get this knowledge and why? Do you have any idea about it? Do I understand the, correct, uh, the question correctly? that you are asking about the background of the statement? Yeah, where, 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 did, she, where, where did she present it? Or, I mean, America has much more problems than only the, uh, the well-being of its mothers, I would say. But um, I have to say that the, the reason why, why it is as a part of the proposition, a proposition statement, the part of my thesis is because it partly relates to my thesis. And this is why it spoke to me. I don't know. Um, why she was uh, why she was writing it, but um, if I can comment on maybe how it relates to my thesis and the situation here is that not here but situation in Eastern Europe. Um, so by saying that, if you want to look at the well-being of, of its matters, you look at the country's health system, and it is partly true. It is true because maternal care is received. Uh, and, and that depends on, on, on care system, because when you compare, when you look at the broader level, not only within European context, East and West comparison, but going worldwide, global, um, then you see that states that are fragile, that have very, um, uh, how do you say that, the health systems that are very, um, not fragile, fragmented, that's the word mm -hmm. I was looking for, fragmented healthcare systems. Uh, with little to no um, funding and, and the care coverage. 
then you there in those if you see maternal care indicators such as maternal death and access to care on a macro level you see that in those countries it is worse so from that perspective you could say that it really um, healthcare system is very important for maternal health outcomes but my thesis also shows that it's not enough it's not only maternal care system that it's also those uh, macro uh, micro level indicators more this the social aspects as well okay thank you very much i'm very satisfied with your answers and i give back the word to the prorector thank you very much professor Neus. the opposition will be continued by professor marianne nieuwhuizen she is professor of midwifery at our university thank you prorector dear candidate i want to compliment you with this interesting and also informative Jesus, as a member of the European cost section on childbirth, I've worked with researchers from Latvia and Bulgaria and Romania. So I really was, um, your work helped me to understand a little bit more about this health system. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to talk with you about the um, indicators on micro level. They've been mentioned a couple of times in this meeting. They're at several places in your thesis. So I'm wondering, what do you have concretely in mind? What kind of micro level uh, indicators would you like to establish and use? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for all the compliments on the thesis. And thank you for your question. Um, by my, so by uh, system level indicators, I meant um, I was also explaining this today in my presentation that there are more the number of healthcare uh, facilities and the number of healthcare providers. But when we will go a lower level, <laughs> then also we would need to look at the, dis uh, the distribution of healthcare facilities. Then uh, not only the, pub the coverage that women have, but even though the, uh, the public health coverage says women are entitled to four antenatal visits to postnatal visits and so on. So, so what is the actual um, ability to pay for care for the rest, uh, for, for the remaining fees? And, uh, and these things like provider attitude and communication, these are not captured on the, on the mic macro level. Mm -hmm. And that's why, and therefore, if you're only taking into account such macro level view, many problems that exist to access, that are barriers to access care are concealed. Mm -hmm. They are not so visible. And by, un, uh, by revealing these other problems that contribute also to accessing care and there later to poor maternal health outcomes, they are important to be taken into account for, when evaluating um, the access. So I was wondering when I was reading about it, are you familiar with value-based healthcare and with the indicators developed by the International Consortium of Health Outcome Measurements? Thank you for your question. Now it is a uh, <laughs> it is simple my, yes or no. I, I am a I am a yeah well I am a part of a research line which is value based healthcare. <laughs> then, now it's a check of me, but how much I know about it. Um, but it, if you if you want to ask a question follow up question based on some of those aspects, mm -hmm. maybe you could specifically refer to. Uh, yes, some so part of those. I was one. You know the indicators are also about satisfaction with yeah. care, about depression complaints about mother and child bonding, uh, such aspects. So do you think they should be part of a micro level indicator set? Absolutely, because access to adequate uh, care, this is why um, I was differentiating and make, trying to make very clear that there's a difference be be between accessing any care and accessing adequate care. And adequate care is not only quality care, adequate is more than that, it's timely, it's patient-centered, it includes um, the care satisfaction as well and, and also how, how mother feels and, and how baby feels. Mm -hmm. And um, if, when you refer to the um, depression and, and those conditions, mm -hmm. then uh, it is not only in this part of Europe where postnatal care is, um, 
what women are least satisfied with, but also the most neglected part of maternal care. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot has to be done there. Yeah, okay, that's what I heard as well. So another question, um, you included care providers in uh, interviews, uh, mainly looking at uh, their perspective on women's access to adequate care and how barriers work for women. Um, I assume talking with them that you also talked about the barriers they experience when performing uh, adequate care, when do it, uh, to, towards women-centered care. So could you elaborate on that, what came up in the interviews you did with them? Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so this questionnaire, uh, these inter in the interviews were, were uh, done in, in two countries, in Georgia and in Latvia. And um, in each country has slightly different problems uh, or different uh, barriers to access care. And, um, and also providers are experiencing um, their working conditions and their situation differently because of very different contexts and very different care systems. Um, the question was what they, can you repeat it again? What, what they experience as barriers towards women-centered care? So I from a say, care yeah. provider's perspective. The questions uh, were asked on these five aspects mm -hmm. of access to care. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, so the question, uh, the interview guide was developed to be very similar to the questionnaires and group discussions that were held with women. Um, the only difference was that um, care provide, it was a little bit adjusted on um, on some aspects of um, use of medical guidelines, for example, that, that women wouldn't know how to answer. But also um, that, of course, care providers are, are, are commenting on access to care on behalf of women, but from their perspective. So there were no direct questions in the, in the interview guides that were prepared that would uh, question how, um, so basically these, these aspects that you were just asking. So it was not uh, specifically investigating their, uh, their, their position. Their perspective, yeah. yes. But no aspects came up. I mean, you, yes. when you do an interview, you try to try to have a talk as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's also, of, of course, the things that came up were also that um, part of the problem in all this access to care is also um, their position and, and their possibilities and their working conditions. So when you were um, when you see that there is an increased shortage in, um, in especially inpatient care facilities in public sector, you can imagine that some factors what came up there were that people, the staff is overworked. They are supervising so many women at the same time, and that and they are underpaid while working those very long shifts of 24 hours, 12 hours, and, uh, and, and working many, many over hours to compensate for the shortage of medical providers. They still need to think that the back of, the, back of their mind that are they able to pay their bills? And, and from the midwife's perspective, what is the role of the midwife in those countries? So when interviewing some midwives, it was clear that the role of midwives have to be strengthened there. Um, but that's a very complex issue that I think needs more than a couple of minutes of explanation. But I think it would really, really help if, if the role of midwives was stronger in uh, Eastern European countries, also from economic point of view, but yeah, that's what the that. WF says as well. Alina Matanis. Alina Matanis. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed now. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company will await the results of our deliberation and our return into this room.
Ik 
Yeah. Well, maybe with with uh, yeah, huh? and then if it's not going well, stay a little bit.
Alina Mutinis, the degree committee here present, has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Groot is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I agree. I do. <laughs> promise, but also uh, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee, committee here present, I hereby confer upon you Elina Mitenice, the degree of doctor, and grant you all the rights attached to it by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Mitinicia, dear Elina, it gives me great pleasure to be the first uh, to congratulate you with your PhD degree. I also do this on behalf of Milena and Bernd, Bernd who has uh, joined us online from the European Observatory uh, here uh, today. Uh, but his presence, I think, is also good to acknowledge here because he contributed also much to the supervision of your uh, work. I speak for the three of us when I say that you have done a fine job. It's been a great pleasure to work with you and to continue to work with you and to have supervised you during your PhD research. The shine of your dissertation and your defense today also shines upon us. We're very proud of your achievement. This is a special and exceptional day. A PhD defense is always something special, something I think you only should do once in your life and something not many people can say they've ever done in their life. The reason why this is a special and exceptional event is not only because you've done a great job doing the defense. We expect, already expected you would do well and, and the defense went uh, very well, I think, I, 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 in my opinion. You've written an excellent dissertation that has increased our knowledge and insight uh, on access to maternity care in Central and Eastern Europe. Your dissertation shows that barriers to access have created markets for all sorts of services in maternity care. Uh, in these countries. As the costs of these services are not covered by the public health system, this gives rise to informal payments uh, and other informalities. The most striking of these informal markets is those for a decent treatment when giving birth. If women do not pay informally, they run the risk of being abused, yelled at, or being left to themselves at the moment they give birth. 
It also frequently leads to women receiving unnecessary invasive care like C-sections, simply because this is a source of additional call it, uh, income to the so, uh, provide these forms of care. These informal payments in themselves pose a barrier to access to good quality of maternity care. It's not surprising, therefore, that your dissertation also shows that satisfaction with the maternity care uh, ex ex that expectant mother, expecting mothers receive is frequently very low. It's also a bit sad to see that more than 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet system in Central and Eastern Europe, so little improvements have been uh, made. Although Professor Nye has uh, pointed out that some countries have done better uh, than others in improving the system. It's still noteworthy that some of these countries still uh, uh, are doing quite poorly. What is particularly noteworthy is that you apply a variety of research methods in your dissertation. You have conducted a systematic literature review and did both quantitative and qualitative research. You have collected your own data through Facebook groups and applied, and applied econometric techniques to existing survey data. And perhaps most important of all, you engage in what sociologists term participating observation. You gave birth to a beautiful son, Oliver, be present as well, and, and really attentive to what his mother is doing now. Um, you gave birth not in Latvia or Georgia, uh, as the results of your research shows that may not be such a great idea, but you did it here in Maastricht at ACDM. Um, you also shared some experience of that in your defense as well. Anyway, anyway, I think no one could have missed it, because it figures prominently in your uh, dissertation uh, as well. Uh, we have a tradition uh, that we end the laudation by citing some appropriate poetry. Uh, the founding father of Latvian poetry is, if I'm not mistaken, Reynes. Uh, Reynes was born at, uh, at the end of the 19th century and had a profound influence on Latvian nationalism. He was also inspired by the works of Hegel and Marx. And here is a quote from one of his poems. One word I have, harsh as it might seem, when idle and solemn your spirit is, when you have become a burden to yourself, there's but one remedy to be found, work. Um, I don't know whether you found yourself a burden, but you have worked hard on this during these past years. You started your research for your PhD part-time alongside an otherwise busy job as store manager at a fashion shop, uh, shop here in Maastricht. And impressed by your perseverance, uh, Milena and I, organized a contract for you as a PhD candidate. Um, you have written a, an elaborate thesis with five papers, where most dissertations include only four, of which three have now been published in good quality peer-reviewed journals. And I'm certain that the other two papers in your dissertation will also be published in good journals soon. On top of that, you did quite uh, some teaching as well. Uh, we were happy to have you as a tutor uh, in the health economics course. You supervise students writing their theses. And the highlight of the year, you organized a study trip for students to Krakow. Uh, and you shared all of the experiences you had in Krakow and, and in getting there um, with us as well. All of this you did with great effort and talent. Now let me give you another quote from a poem by Reynes uh, that runs as follows. Fight, help, think, judge and weigh for yourself, be a master, open the door to happiness yourself. I think that we can safely say that now with Oliver uh, in your family, um, you have become a master of your own happiness. Elaine and I have witnessed some of this mastery as well. I was touched by what you wrote in your acknowledgement section that Elaine and I were more than just supervisors, that we were like your adopted family. Indeed, on many occasions during our, during our weekly meetings, we talked about everything else but your research. A final advice from Reynes uh, then. Do not allude to wise men. Strive to delve in everything yourself. The one who can the good and evil find shall be the one to build the world anew. Finally, let me again congratulate you, Dr. Mitinice, with your achievement, also on behalf of Milena and Bernd. I also want to take the opportunity to thank the members of the assessment committee um, for their efforts uh, in, and work in evaluating the thesis and for providing opposition here today. And I especially want to extend my congratulations to uh, Erika Richardson and Professor Lasdane, who joined us online 
for the uh, defense. I also want to extend my congratulations to your husband, Martijn, and your son, Oliver, of course, who's already started reading your thesis, um, and for the family who are present here today, and to everyone who has taken the time to watch the live stream and virtually celebrate this joyful event here with you today. Thank you so much. Dr. Mitunitje, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I would like to congratulate you not only on your name day, but also on the honor that you just achieved today. I think you, uh, your thesis was researched very well. The defense was done really well and, and with passion. So congratulations. Thank you so much. As an uh, administrative uh, uh, message, uh, the audience can uh, leave in a minute. We meet again in the, in the reception room, we call it the Refter. The assessment committee can, uh, can stay here for some pictures. After that, we go with the assessment committee to the stairs to make a few pictures there, uh, there as well. Thank you, assessment committee. Thank you, external members of the assessment committee. That was a nice event today. I close this academic session.